So my name's Joe Gasparetti. I'm a production engineer on Facebook's blob storage team, and I'm here presenting with Satadru, who's a software engineer on the same team. Today we're gonna give you an introduction to F4, Facebook's warm blob storage system. So first of all, what is a blob? Uh, if you've used Facebook before, you may have stepped back and taken a moment to see what the majority of your experience constitutes. Let's look at this particular page. It's mostly photos, and increasing frequency nowadays, videos. These are perfect examples of blobs, and this is what we store in our system. So blob stands for binary large object. These things are unstructured, like JPEG files or MP4 files, or pretty much anything that would be uploaded by a user that you would consider a file. The second property they have is that they're immutable. So things are written once, read many times, occasionally deleted, but never modified in place. As you might imagine, we have a lot of blobs. <laughs> From a little over a decade ago, when we started out with no photos at all, uh, if you look at our graph of photos, we now have over 400 billion photos stored in our blob storage system. And that makes our blob storage system actually the world's largest photo store that we know of. Uh, orders of magnitude larger than the Library of Congress or other photo sharing sites. And so you might ask the question, is a photo uploaded in 2004 the same to our system as one uploaded yesterday? The answer turns out to be no. And this, and this has an interesting property of access rate over time. Uh, so blobs actually cool down over time. What I mean by this is demonstrated here. So on the x-axis, we have blob age uh, from less than a day all the way up to one year. And on the y-axis, we have a normalized read rate, normalized to one year. The two blob types on this graph are photo and video, but this trend actually holds true for the rest of our content as well. What you can see is that a photo uploaded in the last 24 hours will, in aggregate, receive 500 times the number of read requests today than it will a year from now. And the same is just as true of videos. This means that Facebook's blob storage problem can really be broken down into two problems. We have a lot of hot data that gets a lot of read requests, and then we have a lot of warm data that grows over time, uh, but does not get as many requests. Previously, we've talked about the difference, or the, uh, the solution that we have for hot data. So we'll talk about that first and see how it motivates the solution for a new, a new warm storage system, which is F4. So first of all, our, our hot storage system is called Haystack. And as, as with uh, any blob storage system, it has two primary design goals. Uh, the first is throughput, and we achieve throughput in two ways. Uh, first of all, instead of storing the images or blobs directly on disk in a file system, we store them together in large blocks. We call the block a volume, and then we keep an in-memory index of the volume so that any request can be served in a single operation to disk. There's no file system metadata overhead here. This gives you great throughput on the per host level. However, with this extremely hot content, like I showed on the last slide, uh, one host, even with all of the throughput that, that is available from the disk, is still not enough to serve this content. So we need to keep multiple copies as well. Uh, three copies is what we've settled on for Haystack. I know people have alluded to this magic rule of three, and we use it as well. The second property of a hot uh, blob storage system is fault tolerance. Uh, and we also achieve that in two ways. On the host level, we use RAID 6, which present, prevents us uh, from suffering drive, from drive failure, causing data loss. And then we also keep multiple copies. Uh, we keep three copies, as I said, in different data centers, and this protects us from any three host failure. Uh, we, we would have to lose up to three data centers in order to lose the data uh, for having a recoverable failure. Thankfully, that's never happened. <laughs> so let's talk about the storage size. What does it mean that we have all of this replication? As I said, we use RAID 6 on the host level to store our data. That means we have two redundant drives. We can suffer any two drive loss. So, for example, on a 12-drive array, there are two redundant drives, and that means that any byte that you write to your file system takes up about 1.2 physical hard drive byte space. Uh, if you do this over three hosts, the total space required is 3.6x. Pretty substantial. Put that in perspective. You buy 100 petabytes of storage, you're really only getting 28 petabytes of usable space. So let's talk about what, how this might differ from what we would choose for a warm storage system. So in Haystack, as we talked about, our hot storage solution, we need redundancy, and we achieve it with replication. We also need high read throughput, which we also achieve with replication. And as a result, our total stretch factor for each byte written is 3.6 bytes of physical hard drive space. Now, what might we need for a warm storage system? We certainly still need redundancy. Uh, none of this data is cold, and users are, are going to be expected to see this for a long time. We can't lose it. But our read throughput requirement is much less. And we have a third requirement that this data set is ever growing. If you think about the last two months of data being the hot data at Facebook, then the preceding decade is warm data. And you can see that over time, this data set will grow larger and larger. So the question is, can we do better than 3.6? The answer turned out to be yes. And this is the new storage system that we're going to discuss today called F4. By leveraging Reed Solomon encoding, we're able to decouple redundancy from replication. And we're only able to do this by leveraging the need for less throughput. 
This has allowed us to reduce our space requirement from 3.6 physical hard drives per byte stored, hard drive bytes per byte stored, to 2.1. And I'll hand it over to Satadru later, who will give you more details about the magic of this system. But first, let me give you a little context about what our storage system looks like uh, to put this all in perspective. So let's go through two typical requests. A user uploading a photo to Facebook, for example. So this is an HTTP post request, right? The body is the photo, and it hits a web server, in our case, uh, running something like PHP. The, uh, what the web server then does is, is run the application logic, decide what needs to be done, and generate a request to a storage router. This is a component that we maintain of the blob storage system that's aware of the underlying storage architecture, and in the case of this new photo, we're going to write it to Haystack. We'll find three available Haystack hosts that have space for this object, and we'll write it. So now let's let some period of months pass when we say the blob has cooled down. We can then migrate the object into F4. And now a read request comes along. Say, instead of looking at the photo in the news feed, somebody has looked to uh, one of your old albums and flipped through your photos and found one that hasn't been viewed in a while. It's probably in an F4. So a read request comes in for this photo. Instead of hitting our application logic, we talk directly to a CDN, and the CDN talks to the storage router. This is the same component as earlier. It does both reads and writes. Since it's aware of the underlying storage system, it knows to look for this object in F4, and will talk to the right storage host. Uh, the same flow would have been true for a new piece of content, except the request would have gone directly to Haystack. So with that, I'll hand it over to Sadru, who will give you some background as to how we achieve these benefits in F4. Uh, thanks, Joe. So I'll, uh, Joe has already described why we need our ARM storage system. I'll start with briefly describing the, uh, the design requirements for this system. So first of all, we need to store the data as efficiently as possible. Uh, for example, our hot storage, uh, as Joe described, uh, gives us a 3.6x replication. So the warm storage should be much better than that. The second requirement is that it should be highly fault tolerant. And by fault tolerant, I mean it should, uh, it should be able to tolerate uh, disk, host, uh, rack, or data center, any kind of failure. The third requirement is that the read latency of uh, this warm storage system should be comparable to the read latency of, the, of our hot storage system. The intuitive idea is that uh, one, uh, th whether the photo is being served from a warm storage or it is being served from a uh, hot storage, it should be transparent to the user. So F4 provides a very uh, cool solution to uh, this uh, problem. So not only we uh, reduce the replication factor uh, from 3.6x to 2.1x, we actually provide more fault tolerance than Haystack. And how we do that, we'll uh, see in next couple of sli slides. So again, as Joe uh, mentioned, uh, we, we, in F4, we use read Solomon encoding uh, to store the data. So how uh, uh, the data is moved from Haystack to F4? So first, we, uh, and, for, and for this slide, I have used the read Solomon 5 is to 2 uh, for explanation. So let's assume that we have a 10 gig Haystack volume. Uh, we split the, when we are moving the data into F4, we split the data into one gig data blocks. Then we group them together, and uh, for each of the five data blocks, we create two uh, parity blocks. Thus, we get, uh, we get from the 10 gig hashtag volume, we get two stripes, and each of the stripe has seven blocks. Uh, within uh, each stripe, we have five data blocks and two parity blocks. So how the rebuilding works? For this uh, diagram, let's assume we have a uh, photo which is denoted by photo one. It can be, say, my cover photo. And it is located at uh, uh, at offset x within that one gig block, uh, and the size of the uh, object is y. Now, if the block which contains that uh, photo is down, we need to rebuild the uh, data. And to rebuild, we need to read y bytes of data at offset x from the parity uh, from the parity block uh, from the uh, from the uh, peer blocks of its stripe. A couple of points to note here is that let's assume the photo size is uh, 100 KB. So to rebuild, we need to uh, we need to uh, read 500 KB of data. We do not need to need to read the whole set of whole one gig blocks. One more point uh, that how we are placing these uh, blocks uh, is very critical uh, to the system, and it defines how uh, much fault tolerant our system is. As an example, if, uh, we would have, uh, if we would have placed all these uh, uh, seven blocks in a single host, and that if that single host goes down, then there is no way we could have rebuilt the data. 
So our uh, introduction, we, uh, our placement policy is that we place blocks of each stripe in, is in different racks. Also, for the explanation, I uh, used uh, Reed Solomon 5 is to 2, but in actual production, we use Reed Solomon 10 is to 4. So, what that gives us is that within our 14 racks, we can at any time we can lose 4 random racks, but still be able to serve all the data which is stored there. Next, I will uh, explain the concept of a cell. A uh, cell is a basic building block of the effort storage. The whole effort storage is uh, made of a set of independent cells. Within a cell, we have three kind of nodes. Uh, first kind of node is the, is the storage node, which actually stores the data in, their, uh, in the hard disks. The second kind of node is the compute node. Uh, the compute node uh, is needed for the Reed Solomon decoding. Those are the CPU heavy machines. The third kind of node is the coordinator node, which basically monitors the health within the system and schedules all kind of maintenance jobs. Now, uh, we will explain how the F4 read works. So, this is the core part of how uh, overall the F4 storage system works and how it provides, uh, uh, how it provides good latency compared to Haystack. So, in F4, the reads are uh, two, either two-phased or three-phased and those phased are, uh, uh, those phased are, uh, uh, are orchestrated by the router layer. So, first a user request hits the router layer. Uh, after that, the router layer sends the first phase of the request, which is an index read. In an index read, we uh, give uh, uh, the input is a, a volume ID and, a, and the blob ID, and the response we get back is the exact physical location of the blob. By exact physical location, I mean that the storage node which actually contains the blob in, their, in its disk, the file name, the offset, and the size. And then in the next uh, stage, the router issues a data read. And the data read is issued to the storage node returned by the index read. So, and in turn, the st storage node, it reads the data from its disk and sends the data back. One point to note here is that uh, similar to Haystack, uh, here also uh, for one data read, uh, for one, uh, to read one blob, we still need to do one IO. Now, what, what happens if the, if the storage node which contains the uh, blob is down or the disk is down? So, uh, in that case, the data read stage will fail and in, after that, the router will issue one more uh, request and that's a decode read request to the compute nodes. So, uh, once compute node gets the decode read request, so it will do a uh, read Solomon decoding from the uh, peer uh, uh, stripe blocks and send out the data to the router. So, one point to note here is that uh, the compute nodes here and the more specifically the decode read stage, it makes a cell fault tolerant to uh, host failure, uh, disk failure, host failure, and even rack failures. But uh, one more uh, failure mode is data center failure, where basically the whole cell can be down. So how we handle that? So this is the setup. So uh, the overall idea is that we create a cross-region uh, parity, and in this case, we just create a simple XOR. So let's assume we have volume one in cell one, uh, volume 2 in cell 2, we create a byte by byte XOR and create a XOR volume and place it in a third cell, cell 3. And here cell 1, cell 2, cell 3, they, they are in three different data centers. Also one more point to note is uh, when I am uh, creating this XOR volumes, I copy the both the indexes of source volumes uh, into the XOR cell. Uh, so index is very small compared to the actual data. So, it, the, the storage cost is like, uh, uh, I mean, it's neg negligible. Now, in this setup, how the read works. So, let's assume that some uh, user request hits router 2 and also assume that the user is requesting a photo which is present in volume 2. So, the router 2 sends the request to cell 2 and now let's say the cell 2 is down, completely down. So, now router 2 what it does is it sends out an index read request to the 
XOR cell and gets back the exact physical location of the data. After that, it sends two parallel data read request to two nearby routers, router one and router three. So router one is near to data center one and router three is near to data center three. So after that router one and router uh, three, they do uh, two parallel data read, data read requests and point to note here is that these data read requests can again be multi-phased and that's why we have uh, proxied the data read request to the nearby routers so that the uh, for the multi-phase we do not, uh, do not uh, suffer any latency loss. So one more point is what is the storage complex uh, and, uh, and after the, uh, the data read phase is complete, so uh, the router 2 does a XOR of the data to actually rebuild the photo uh, and then send it back. So what is the storage complexity of this system? So given we are doing a XOR byte by byte XOR of volume 1 and volume 2 and storing it in another volume. So for each two logical bytes, we are uh, storing three bytes. So this gives us a complexity of 1.5. And in each cell, as I have already mentioned, that we are using Reed Solomon 10 is to 4, that has a overhead of 1.4. So overall, the storage complexity becomes 1.5 into 1.4, that is 2.1x. Thus, we, uh, uh, we reduce the replication factor of hashtag 3.6x to 2.1x and yet we are tolerant to all kind of uh, failures which is that is a disk, host, uh, uh, rack failures and data center failures. Next, this is a brief comparison, a comparison of uh, how hashtag and F4 uh, performs on different metrics. So the replication factor I have already mentioned. Uh, the irrecoverable disk failures. So what is that? So that means that how many disks we need to lose simultaneously so that we can't even rebuild the data. For Haystack, uh, to lose data in each of the hosts, we need to lose three disks because we are storing the data in a RAID 6 configuration. So the total disk we need to lose in Haystack is nine to lose the data permanently so that we can't rebuild the data. In F4 system, the number is 10. How? Uh, so to lose the data, here point to remember is that to lose the data, we need to lose, uh, we have like, uh, in the cross DC setup, we have like one cell and also there is two uh, cells which is, uh, I mean we are exhorting between three cells. So within those uh, three cells, we need to lose two cells. And to lose one cell, we need to lose five disks because uh, if we lose five disks, then we will, won't be able to do our Reed-Solomon uh, decoding because we are storing it in a 10 is to uh, four uh, RS encoding. So that, that gives us a total uh, irrecoverable disk failure count of F4 is 10, which is more than hashtag. Similarly, the host failures and rack failures, they, uh, the calculation uh, basically follows from the uh, from the disk failure uh, calculation, so I'll not go into them. And the irrecoverable data center failures for Haystack, given we have three copies, so we can uh, uh, lose, uh, I mean to lose the actual data, we need to lose three data centers. For F4, uh, we have, uh, again, as I mentioned, for the triplet cells, uh, where uh, in between we are creating the XOR parity, we need to lose two of them among the three to lose the data. The load split, uh, the hashtag for uh, hashtag, we have uh, like three copies of the data. So each of the copy gets uh, one third of, the, of its load. Whereas in F4, uh, the, there is one main copy and the one XOR copy. The XOR copy is, uh, is only getting load when there is a data center failure. So all the load is going to the main copy. So the, uh, but in F4, uh, as the load is, as we described that the load requirement is not that strict here, so we are fine here. So I'll conclude the talk. So this is the, the source paper. So it was published in OSDI 2014, and this is the link. Now, is there any questions? Yeah. Okay. I have like 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so do you, do you age everything out of Haystack based on like age 
statistics, or can you predict which photos are going to get boring faster? Yeah, that's a uh, good question. So uh, our uh, the graph which Joe showed that basically uh, our uh, access pat rate that decreases with the with age. So uh, so it's based on age and access pattern follows the age. That's that's the basically basic building block of the this storage. That's true and for even like me and Taylor Swift. So hmm. even even if that's not true for individual objects, it's true at the aggregate level. And we store many many photos together in one volume. So if you put you know a million photos in one volume, it will be true that that volume gets less accessed later. And also one more point is that uh, in the read path, we have a CDN layer backing us up. So uh, even if one photo gets very old, it will be after some time it will be cached by CDN. So that will also protect us. Thank you. Thanks.